think we have some slides here we can look at, but talk to us about where building is, is mm. happening in Canada. I don't well, know if, let me pull you can up go back. You can go back to the first slide, actually. So, so, so we, we do have new apartments bu uh, being built across Canada. We probably have maybe three or 400 buildings, you know, in the planning stages or under construction. I think I visited, you know, a, a, a large percentage of these. But, but I think I could say this pretty fairly, that when I look at apartment buildings in Canada, we're generally, generally underwhelmed. Um, I think, the, think there could be a lot more creativity, there could be a better amenity space, better apartment design, you know, and, and certainly better. Are you better. saying we're building crappy apartments? Is that what you're saying? I, I, think, I think we could be building better apartments, yeah. yeah. I, I, I really do, and I don't think it's necessarily spending more money. I think it's, I think it's, a, case of, uh, I think it's a case of design. Now, let me give you sort of some classic mistakes that I see, right, in a high rise. So you'll have a, a condominium developer, uh, and he's a logical guy to build an apartment. Yeah. Right, so he'll think like a condominium developer. He won't put um, leasing offices in there because you know once you sell a condo, you sell it and you move on. In a brand new apartment building, you're going to have turnover for the rest of your life at the rate of 30 or 35 percent or 40 percent if you have a lot of young people living there. So you've got to plan for that leasing space there forever, right? right. Even 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 the elevators. You need to have a back door and a moving room because if you sell a condo, you sell it once and then maybe it turns over three, four, five percent a year. In the apartment business, you've got people moving out 30, 40% of them, right? So they need to have a proper move-in structure. Like even simple things like that, you know, we, you know, we'll see occurring. And, and generally, you know, when you compare the apartment business to the condominium business, um, in the condominium business, you sell the steak, right? It's the pragmatic condo buyer. He's asking, what's the price per square foot? What are the operating costs and things like that? When you sell an apartment building, you're selling the sizzle on the steak, right? So developers are often surprised to hear that the lobby of the apartment building should look better than the condo building. And it should, because in the apartment business, it's about the arrival experience, right? The condo, the guys bought it from plans, right? When you come to rent you got to sell with that space every yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, it's like a hotel, like you kind of, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you've also got to design your building um, a little bit more robustly, mm -hmm. right? In a condominium, you've got a homeowner, right? Mm -hmm. In, in, in a rental building, you've got a pretty upscale renter, but he doesn't own it. But it's kind of like when, when you rent a car, you know, you never top it up with premium gas. Like it's just not yours, yeah. right? So you top it up with water, right? Like, so you, you, just think a little, you just think a little differently as a renter. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, uh, back on the supply, is, is there any place, are there any places that already have good supply in uh, Canada? Is there any place that's overbuilt or go, about to overbuild? Yeah, 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 go, go, go to the slide that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come to in a second here. Um, yeah, that one right there. Um, so, interestingly enough, that there are two places in Canada that have, I'd say there's one place in Canada that's actually overbuilt, and that would be the city of Waterloo in student housing. And that, that was just a, a phenomenon that occurred where the city of Waterloo uh, changed the zoning around, and there are two universities close together there, they changed the zoning around, and a lot of developers jumped in and built, you know, five bedroom, two bath uh, student housing facilities. And they all, they all filled up pretty well, but I think we're reaching the, the saturation point now. Probably the city in Canada that I would talk about the most about in terms of having a, a good balance of rental supply would be London, Ontario. Uh, for a number of reasons, but one being it just had a city with four or five people who were strong financially, had integrated uh, you know, skills and, and built a lot of apartments. So, so just look at, look at the data here, okay? So and I'll just try and explain. We looked at four cities, and uh, then we looked at the total number of rented dwellings. So those are people who on the census said, we rent. Doesn't mean they're necessarily renting an apartment, they're renting a house, a duplex, uh, a condo, whatever it is, right? And then the next column over is the estimated rental universe, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at London, 56,000 people in London say they rent, right? 39,000, there's 39,000 apartments in London, right? And that leaves 17,000 people in the secondary universe, around 30%. Not everybody wants to live in a purpose-built apartment. Some people do want to live in houses, some people live in duplexes and, you know, and things like that. But look at, look at Vaughan, okay? So Vaughan has you know, 6,600 people who say they rent, and there's only 57 apartments there. For those of you who aren't from here, Vaughan is a suburb north of Toronto with about 700,000 people, right? And so 99% of the people in Vaughan are living in non-apartments. Okay, pop quiz, Vince, why? You didn't know I was gonna do this. Because there's, there's no choice, they don't. Why are there no apartments in Vaughan? Um, 1975, rent well, controls came in, yeah. new construction stopped, and Vaughan grew after 1975, right? So if you think about all those cities around Toronto that grew after 1975, when rent controls came in, all apartment construction stopped. 
We tried so, to build some after. I'll never forget when Roger Anderson, who's a, he's a friend of mine actually, was the chair of Durham Region, mm -hmm. uh, and people were trying to wanted to build in a few apartments in a few spots in uh, Durham Region. He said, uh, "We don't build those here. That's what they build in Toronto." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't but, want them. But some but, of that. but but I hope you see the point that I'm making here, right? So there are places you, you know where where there's been no new apartment structure, and it's a screaming demand. So people often say to me. Um, you know, um, is there demand? There, there's demand almost everywhere because we've had a 30, 40 year hiatus of building apartments, right? And the population has grown. Even in small towns throughout um, Ontario, there's an older population there, right? That wants to leave their house. They're not ready for their retirement home. And they can't be happy with what the market's offering them yeah, now. They don't, and, and they want a purpose built. They, they wind up staying their home longer or they're forced to sell their home and buy a condominium and things like that. The the renter pool then, it's, sorry, it's sort of dumbbell shaped. There's there's younger people, mm -hmm. and then there's older people, right? And the younger people have the disposable income, right? But maybe not necessarily the down payment to buy a home, or maybe they just don't want a home. Yeah. And, and, that's, and then older people have the money, but they just want to lock and leave, right? They want to sell their, sell their house, use that equity to enjoy themselves, and things like that. All right, let's keep moving along here. Alberta, uh, you know, uh, it's, this is a national uh, forum. Tell me what you think about what's going on there. When I was out in Alberta, yeah. when I was in the sub-metering business, every every single developer we talked to had a rental building plan. When they yeah. hadn't built one in yeah. decades, there True. every single one of them. True. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, I, I think that I think the product in Alberta, when I said was uh, was 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 underwhelming, it's it's maybe even a little more underwhelming in Alberta. It, it feels a little bit more like workforce housing. They just sort of put up quite quickly. It's four story stick on the prairie with the wind whistling through it, kind of thing, right? It it could be better. Right, mm -hmm. it could be better, but I think the the reaction to Alberta is that is that it, it, people overreacted to it. Mm -hmm. I think the REIT stock prices, you know, overreacted and went down. Rental rates probably, you know, vacancies did spike up, but but they're coming back again. So when you look at Calgary, which is a city of you know 1.3 million people, it only has 39,000 apartments. London has 39,000 apartments with 300,000 yeah. people. So I think Alberta is probably pretty good. I, I I don't think it's I don't think it's falling apart, and. I would say that's particularly true for the apartment. And like maybe industrial might be a problem in Alberta, right? Mm -hmm. But I think in the apartment sector where it was nowhere near being overbuilt, there probably is, is room to keep building in Alberta. Yeah, okay. I don't think it's as bad as people think. Let's talk about another issue, the shadow market. So everybody, you know, this is a big issue in, in the major uh, uh, centers, particularly Toronto and uh, perhaps Vancouver. It's a giant shadow market for rental, like you don't see in the American cities. Yes. So what does that mean for uh, rental development? Yeah, go to the slide with the McLean thing on it. Yeah. So, so, so when, when Vince says the shadow rental market, what he's talking about is, for, for whatever reason in the, the McLean's yeah, 19, so, yeah. So for whatever reason, cities like Vancouver and Toronto in particular have a huge foreign buyer market mm -hmm. and local buyer market, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just foreign buyers. It's local guys who yeah. like to invest in condos, and it's become sort of a a very, very trendy thing to do. So people buy condominiums and, 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 and rent them out. Um, so the problem first is with the shadow market is you've got 100, let's say you've got 100 unit condominium, 70 of the owner, owners might have bought and are renting the condo out. So there's no continuity. There's no pet policy. The guy beside me might not have a criminal check. They might not have the number of people living in the building. When something goes wrong in the building, there's a security guard at the front gate making 12 bucks an hour hired by the condo corporation. He's not there to service the residents in the building. So what you find is, is that these buildings are, are, are kind of chaotic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and the wear and tear on them, things don't get fixed. And, you know, the, the way a, a long-term apartment owner is. Because now you've got 100 owners each buying it for a different reason, right? right? And so, so it, it's really not a solution to the rental market. But the, the biggest problem we see with this is, even if you're willing to put up with those things, right? Um, is that you have no tenure and you've got to move when your client wants to move and you're, you're choosing rentals for, for a lifestyle reason. You're a discretionary renter. You could afford to buy that condo with the rent you're paying. So right? do you think there's a premium in a purpose-built rental building compared to some of those shadow is, rentals? Yes, there is definitely a premium in that. There's yeah. definitely a premium. And that's, and that's what I, the very first question you said, why do deals not pencil out? Mm -hmm. Well, because people just, it's very easy. Go on MLS and you find 30 condos in the building you just built and the average rent comes up to 220 a foot. You go, okay, that's the rent. But if you think about how that apartment got rented, no sales office, no web page, you know, a real estate agent who got half a month's rent for filling it up, he just wants to get it full, mm -hmm. right? No credit check on the guy and all those issues. So yeah, the rents are 20% lower sometimes, 30% lower than what they could be if you had a functioning building with uh, a leasing office and a management office and, you know, and, 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 and a sales presence in the building. Okay. Uh 
Does every building have to be a luxury building when you're, when you're building? Do they all have to be at the high end when you're building rentals? Yes. They do? Derek, these people paid a lot of money. Can you, uh, <laughs> no, can you no, elaborate no, no. on that a little bit? No, it, 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 <laughs> I, th I, th I think the answer is, is, is just yes, because if, if you build an affordable building and, you know, I don't know, Mark, you guys can maybe help me, 90% of your money is spent on the structure. Do you know what I mean? And so, so when you step up the, you know, the flooring and you step up the countertop and the appliances, that, that's the last 5 or 10% of what you're spending, yet that's going to give you significantly more rent. Back right? to your earlier slide, is the return on those, uh, yeah, those yeah. increased investments? Look, if you want to build affordable housing, you need some kind of government program, right? Yep. Or you build it 30 years ago and then today it becomes affordable as it gets older, yep. right? And that's the problem, Ontario, that we stopped building apartments in 1975. Had we kept building them, that stuff built in the late 70s and 80s and 90s would have gotten older and its rent would have dropped. So it's that gap that created the problem. And quite frankly, we get rents, too high rents for too old buildings because of, because of the lack of choice. Right? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the demand side. Uh, where is all this demand coming from that we're, you know, that's driving this uh, market? Yeah. You might yeah. have a, do we have some? Yeah, we have the, a slide. the slide there actually has a blue map on it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's, so, so, you know, when you're dealing with large amounts of data, uh, you know, we use something called GIS where you can just show graphically, you know, um, uh, the picture here. So we marked on there the subways in red and then, and then the major highways um, in black. And then we just said, okay, so where do the people who are 25 to 34 live? So in the downtown areas, that's, that's sort of your target market. Fair enough? And the beauty here of the, of the downtown renter is he doesn't need a car. And if he doesn't need a car, then he has more money to pay for his rent, right? And this is the guy Vince described as he sleeps in the building lives in the or sleeps in the apartment and lives in the building and the neighborhood right. right so here you're going to build you know smaller apartments right but amenity rich the fitness center is going to look great right yeah. the the front lobby might look like a w hotel mm -hmm. right that's going to have wi-fi and people are going to come down there and sit in it the same way that you might do when you go to a hotel right you just mm -hmm. come down because you want to be part of the action you know and things like that okay um why would these people just buy a house, some of these people you're talking about? Um, first of all, not everybody can afford a house, and, and that's getting harder and harder in Toronto to afford a house, right. right? So number one is the amount of money you need for the down payment. Right. And number two is people live flexible lives today, right? I mean, people do a lot of contract work, people move around and things like that. So that idea that maybe, you know, you and I had, right, and that our parents had about home ownership being sort of the bedrock of your financial life, is just not necessarily what uh, well, what my children think today, or, or, or what younger people think today. Yeah, um, I think there's and, definitely and, a trend there. Right, right. And then, old, as I said, it's dumbbell shape, right? Older people have the money, but they are discretionary renters, and, and they want the freedom to just lock the door and to leave and not worry about anything. They don't want even to have a condo board, you know, and things like that. And there's a lot more of those people than people think. And but they're stuck where they are. London would be a really good example. Um, you know, one of the deals we did was the, was the Cherry Hill deal in London. It was uh, 2,300 2, units um, owned by, owned by a, a great family, really, really, really well managed. 85% of the people living there were seniors. Right. Right? And the delinquency was $5,000 on $27 million in income. Right? Seniors make great residents. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, we ought to talk about this. It's, it, I mean, it's all over the news. International companies are writing about it. Stephen Polos came out a week ago and said, uh, you know, there's huge downside risk in Toronto uh, and Vancouver. Um, an international agency came out this week and said Vancouver is a bubble. Um, so on the demands, what kind of risk are people facing? Well, if they A go bubble in housing prices. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, a bubble in housing prices, so the market could collapse. What are the implications for someone who's considering a rental building? Of yeah, this? yeah. Well, it, it could be a bubble. We've been calling this for a while, right? So, so yep. we are uh, what you know. 17. I thought it was too hot in two thousand and five. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're but seventeen <laughs> years. We're seventeen years into an eight-year cycle, yeah. right? So, so let, let's just assume that that happens. I think it's if you look in the U.S., the apartment business has actually taken off since the housing meltdown in, you know, uh, 208 and 209. So people, right. to, they got fed up with houses. They got their equity wiped out. So they are returning to the apartment marketplace. But look, you are never going to go to a worse place to live unless you have a catastrophic meltdown in your life, right? So if you're a senior living in a 3,000 square foot house, you're not going to find a 3,000 square foot apartment. You'll go down to 1,500 square feet or 1,200 square feet, but it's got to be nice, Yeah. right? Yep. And, and so I think the impact on 
rental housing will be minimal. I suspect it would be positive, right? And, um, and, and I think that apartments have successfully separated themselves from the rest of the financial economy. And if you look at 208 and 209, right? Nothing happened to apartment values. Everyone was sitting there saying, finally, we get a chance to buy some apartments at a lower price, right, yeah. in Canada. Yeah. I think in the U.S. there might have been a little more. But there were no bargains out there. We went out, we made the trip with all the, all the lenders. We got to meet the special services guy. And, you know, we picked up one deal in Windsor, 44 units to sell, you know, in that whole downturn. So I think apartments in Canada, uh, vacancy rates didn't go up, prices didn't go down. So they've separated themselves from the, from the normal economy. All right, so let's uh, transition over to some development strategy discussions. Sure. Design the perfect apartment building for me, Derek. What is the perfect apartment building? You know, um, the, the first question I have to ask you is, is, is where is that building, right? Because the perfect building here might be completely the wrong building here, right? right. So if you're designing a perfect building at, at Main and Main in, in downtown Toronto that's subway oriented, then I would argue that maybe the perfect building, and now I'm talking about returns to the investors being perfect, right? would be zero parking, uh, because parking is a real drag on a performa. So you're gonna spend 30, 40, 50,000 dollars per spot, and the lower you go, the more expensive it gets. And you're maybe gonna get $100, $150 in rent. So that's a 2% return, right, on your, on, on your parking costs. So I would start sort of, you know, with the parking. How do you minimize the parking? And there's lots of ways to do that. First, you've got to work with the city. You've got to be transit oriented, have zip cars and things like that. Yeah, maybe your, your, your rent or pool will go down, right? But you can also bring your price per apartment down now so that you're into the wider part of the market, right? So that'd be number one would be to just think about things like parking. Number two would be probably amenity space. And you know, you pay for amenity space once and it, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, as the unit, as the apartment gets larger, there's, a, there's an economies of scale there. So amenity space is, uh, is important. And then, and then the apartment design. We've got some pretty good architecture today that'll be talking about you know, apartment design. Um, and certainly I would say that generally speaking, units have to get smaller, right? Um, you know, to, 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 bring the rent level, to bring the rent level down. Now, if you take that apartment building, Vince, and you move it out to the Burbs, right? Move it out to Vaughan, where, where you know, you've got affluent people, homeowners now getting older and things like that. That's not the same building. There you definitely need parking because you need a car and vaughn, right? Uh, you'll need larger apartments because those people are generally coming out of homes, right? And so it, it, it depends on, on where the building is. It depends on also the, um, the, the, the income of the people in the area. So if you build an apartment in Forest Hills, and Forest Hills is an affluent part of Toronto, right? Mm -hmm. um, what you'll find is that Typically, on, on, on the price curve, as an apartment gets, goes from like 400 square feet to like 1,000 square feet, the price per square foot comes down, right? So you'll have maybe $4 per square foot on your bachelor apartment, and then as it gets larger, the price per square foot might come down. But then you'll see sometimes, and only sometimes in certain areas, the rents will start going up as the apartments get larger because there's wealthy people there wanting to rent apartments and there aren't enough of them, right? right? So it's a very, very localized question and you do it based on you know, the competitors you've got, the income, the age, the transportation, all that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah. supplemental question on the perfect sure. uh, apartment building. Can you design a, an apartment building that a mother-in-law wouldn't want to leave? Your mother-in-law. <laughs> um, okay, maybe, yeah, could, maybe yeah, couldn't yeah, leave. Yeah, 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 absolutely, I'm <laughs> absolutely. Maybe I'll take but, this one offline with you. <laughs> no, 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 but, but I think you have to, but part of it is also creating community. Yeah. Like, why don't some older people want to leave their house because their church is there and their, you know what I mean? And the bank is there and the doctors and the grocery stores there. You've got to create a sense of community in an apartment building. And that example I gave you with the, the Cherry Hill Complex in London, at, that was as done as well as I've seen anywhere. The shopping mall right in the middle, right. that was the community center and it had all the services that the people needed and things like that. Yeah, so it's, it's more than bricks and mortar. It is that service piece. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've had a, a, you know, a nasty history of rent control. So property management and customer service were, were never our issues, Vince. Yeah. Right? I mean, we just, the building got full. Yeah. Our job was to minimize costs. Now that's no longer there. Those skills have to come back. So I would say the people in the hotel business get it right. Yeah. Right? It's about customer service, right? It's about that arrival experience. You know, it's about if something's wrong, I want to fix it for you. I'm not going to you know, tell you it's not wrong or something like that. Yeah. So you mentioned amenities, and I wanted to ask you about this because of, you know, I've been on um, a number of US uh, apartment tours. 
and, and been absolutely blown away with some of the uh, common area spaces yeah. that we've seen. Like we walked into one building in Chicago where they took an entire floor sort of halfway up the building yeah. or on the sixth floor and dedicated, you know, it was a cafe, they got the workout yeah. room, they had everything, yeah. a big beautiful pool, you know, all with the yeah. glass. And this is where people came to hang out yeah. and uh, it was spectacular, you know, you wanted to live there. Yeah. Is anybody doing anything like that here? Has well, anyone tried well, that Well, let's here? just say what you saw in the U.S., um, um, we call that normal. Mm -hmm. that that's what you're expected to do in a competitive marketplace. So one of the places that we like to go and take our clients to is Chicago. It sort of feels a little like Toronto, right? Mm -hmm. High rise city, much, much larger. But there may be 15 or 20 new towers coming out of the ground in, in, you know, in any given year. But when you look at the, the older buildings, know they're coming and they're repositioning for that. Right. You see my point? Yep. So that's the level of competitiveness that exists in the U.S. I would say that in Canada, if you went and and did all the amenities they did in that Chicago building where they take, you know, usually it's a 40-story building and a six-story parking deck, and then they'll take the sixth floor, right, and put a pool out on the deck, and then all the amenities are on the sixth floor or something like that. You could do that here, and, and it might even be a little bit overkill, right, because nobody has it here, right? Um, but but, but that's, that's certainly the place that we're moving to, and the reason they do it is because it financially works. You can drive more revenue that way. Right? So, the, so the more sizzle you put in there, the higher your rent is going to be. And remember that, $100 is equal to $24,000 in value. So it's not lost revenue. It's not zero revenue space you're giving up in your building. It's driving oh, it's a your... It's a, it's a revenue generator. Yeah. I think if you didn't put it in and put in just apartments on that floor, it would hurt you. Yeah. So are we, are we building the wrong product? Do you, uh... you know, in a marketplace that's starved for a product, Mm -hmm. You can build really any product and it'll be successful. Fair enough? So you could build, let's say you should have built 80% one bedrooms and 20% two bedrooms and you build the reverse, right? Mm -hmm. You'll still get full because our marketplace, the vacancies are so low, right? right? But I don't think you'll make as much money as you can and, and that may be why the deal doesn't pencil out. So there's, there's a lot of money made in design, you know, with your architect with your designer, with your property manager, if he understands the business, mm -hmm. right? And so getting their input uh, is important. Okay. Um, okay, if you have no money, how can you build? Well, then you'd be an American developer. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if you can go over to, the, to, to, to maybe the last slide, yeah. right? Um, so I think one of the issues within Canada is that we don't have, uh, yeah, just keep going to the last one is that we don't really have a lot of you know, um, um, mezzanine lenders and equity lenders. I think they're forming now that there's certainly some groups out here, right? The guys from Centurion are here and, and they lend mez money and so on. But I think in the US, it's a, it's a sophisticated business. So if you go into a major organization, there's an apartment guy there and he's looking at apartment deals all day long and he's got mez money to lend, right? And so what happens in, in the capital stack, so this is, let's say, if it's a $100 million building, right? Um, typically, you can get construction financing for 70%. Yep. Right? I'm talking about $100 million construction cost, and then let's just say it's going to be worth $120, $130 million once it's built. So you get 70% you know, debt, 15% MES, and then the equity, you, know, you can vend your land, and maybe it's increased in value. Maybe an equity partner comes in, and he gives you the rest of it. But you know, typically, what you're trying to do is get the equity piece down to you know, 10 or 20% of the equity. So, so the developer wants to put in you know, 10 or 20% of that 15%, right? And, uh, and, and, and this, this is a business where you use leverage. Um, it is a very capital intensive business, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were to build an apartment building on your own, it would cost you 100 million, right? That's like 300 units. You'd need $30 million in, you know, in, in equity. And that, that's a big chunk and it's a big slug for anybody. So typically apartment buildings are built in partnerships with mezzanine and equity partners. And sometimes the equity partner may take out the building right at the end and maybe at a preferential formula um, um, value. Um, or maybe that, or, or maybe he'll just come along. And he wants to make developer profit, and then they'll sell the deal to uh, you know to a third party, hmm. right? But it, it requires a lot of money, and I think the the money here in Canada, and there's a, the finance panel is next, probably the most important panel here today. Um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll talk about those issues. Okay, so um, I'm seeing a lot of people do joint ventures. They, you know, they're dipping their toe into this water. They want to uh, diversify their risk. Talk to me about the pros and cons of approaching this as a joint venture. It, you know, uh, a lot of apartments have to get built in partnerships because of the capital required, right? right? So I think uh, 
professional partners are what's required. And we've done now a number of these deals where we brought the land, the money, and the developer together. And I, here's one thing I've learned, Vince. The way you negotiate is the kind of partner you're going to be, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can never write you know, a contract that's going to cover every scenario. Stuff is going to show up, right? right? One of our developers uh, speaking on the panel uh, uh, tomorrow at the end of the day, um, you know, and, and, and I worked for him as his consultant, as broker. We built a, a $250 million apartment portfolio in phases. And, you know, the, the, there were buyers as phases got done. There were things that happened there that we never could have foreseen. I mean, maybe now in the next deal we'll foresee it, right? But you had to have a relationship with the lender, with the buyer, with the property manager to get through these issues, right? So joint ventures are important, but the aligning of, um, of interests. So when the interests are aligned, you can generally work it out. It's when the interests don't get aligned and you haven't foreseen it that it causes a problem. But joint ventures are a significant way of building apartments. I suspect going forward, as the deals get larger, right? Even, even on the lending side, so if you do a $100 million deal, and you get $70 million, I'm talking about construction, $70 million of construction financing, most lenders don't want to do a $70 million deal. They want to syndicate it, yeah. right? So having the information up front, right, the, 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 the feasibility work, proving the deal so that different people can look at it, right, and say, are you building the right building in the right location for the people, for the people that are there, right? Yeah. And so really what you've got to do is go to that joint venture group and answer five questions. Should you build? What should you build? How much can you charge? What's the depth of the market? And how much money will you make? Right. Okay. And, and that's much easier to do in a U.S. city than a Canadian city because in a U.S. city, there's going to be five competitors across the road. Yeah. Right? So that's the good news and the bad news. The bad news is you've got competition. But the good news is you can see what they've done and learn from them and just you know, make some changes and make your product, product better. Here, there's really nobody across the road. Right? So you're designing that apartment building um, from scratch without having any competitors, that's good news, but you can go to other places, other cities, right, and, um, and uh, figure out what works in the marketplace. But come back, coming back to your question earlier about, you know, that whole sixth floor of many space, should you do that right now? I'm not sure you should do it all, necessarily. I'm not sure you have to go right to the level what the U.S. guys do. Now, if you're building and keeping it for 20 or 30 years and thinking, you know, that market's going to come here and it probably will, then probably do it. But if you're a merchant builder building it to sell it, um, I'm not sure you have to do the, the whole floor, maybe half a floor. You know, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because yeah, that day hasn't arrived here yet fully. Okay. Lease up. How long do you need to budget for, for lease up when you're, uh, when you're planning one of these things? What are, what are people seeing out there? Um, you know, um, one of the speakers, Jennifer this afternoon will talk quite a bit about that. But first, let's just talk about, you know, the timing of the lease up, right? right. So if you think of the, the normal curve, the bell curve that goes like this, your leasing schedule goes January to December, sort of like this, okay? So that's the first thing to remember. It's not even throughout the year. This is a seasonal business. In Toronto, the bell curve is kind of flatter because you've got younger people here. You've got people moving here at different times of year. You can have a decent February in Toronto. You can't have a decent February in, 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 in Chatham or in Peterborough or in smaller or in Sault Ste. Marie. Do you know what I mean? Yep. People just aren't going to move that time of year. So typically, bringing a building to market you know, in winter, getting into the spring, you, you tend to write the most number of leases um, in April, mm -hmm. right, for people then moving in in the summer. I um, you know, on, on larger, smaller buildings, you know, you can get done in a few months, whatever the case is. But on larger buildings, let's say we're, you know, 250 or 300 units. The one thing we want to do is be full within one year, right? Because you don't want to be leasing turnover apartments at the same time as you've got new units, right? So that's typically our goal. What do we have to do to get full within a year? Right? Now that gets complicated when you do larger projects and you're phasing them in. So you've got one building being built and turning over, and then you've got the next building being built, it's all brand new, and then the third one comes on stream. So in your, the delivery of your third building, you're leasing up a whole building here, and 30% of this one and 30% of this one. Right? So that all has to get taken into consideration. But to answer your question simply is, you know, on a larger building, you want to do what you can to, to, to get it done in one year. And, and that requires, you know, pre-leasing, building models early, you know, having a web presence, you know, and things like that early. I think that's something here in Canada that typically, and we get away with it because there isn't that much competition, is we give leasing short shrift, right? Leasing is a key part of the successful, um, of the successful apartment development process. It's, it's, it's probably the, the part that we understand the least. We've got great builders in Toronto. I mean, this is the condominium capital of the world. Right. right? They've figured out how to build these things efficiently, right? Now, the design is to change for an apartment, right? 
but, but the leasing is different than the sales process. So if you think about a, a condo guy, he puts up a trailer and spends a couple million bucks and then sells 70% of his deal, then he spends his 100 million bucks. In the apartment business, we're saying, spend your 100 million first, then we'll find out if you're right. right? So, so just the risk profile, if you haven't done it yet, seems to be much more risky. Right? And that's why that, that feasibility study work, and, and we're busy doing that type of work, that's a good part of our business, is just writing um, you know, detailed reports in financial analysis proving that this thing works on paper. Whereas if we were doing this in the US, I suspect the reports would not have to be that thorough because the guy's already done it. There's four buildings across the road typically. Right? Yeah. So that's this process we're going through right now. Okay, I, uh, last week you may have noticed uh, the province announced the new climate change plan, and one element of that plan was that they were going to um, eliminate parking requirements for projects located on transit corridors, as an example, and possibly other locations. Talk to me about the impact of, of that policy change. Um, that, that, that is probably a good policy change, Yeah. right? Um, what does it do to your pro forma to get the well, it, it's, parking it's a, requirements? It's a so. positive step to your pro forma yeah. because, as I said earlier, your parking spot's going to cost you $40,000, but you're only going to rent it out for $100, $150. So if you build too much parking, then you, know, you, just, you just can't really rent it out, right? Because you want to be running a, a pay-for-thing service. If you build too little, it, it sort of hurts your rental. But if you get in transit-oriented areas, people will give up their cars. That's, that's what we found in the US. People will give up their cars in downtown locations. The one that has to keep their car will find something local garage you can put in zip cars. I would say that's, that's a positive thing. So um, that'll stimulate some activity, you think? Um, it, it, it's, it, it's, can you go to the slide with all the gears on it? Sure. I, think that, I, th I think that sort of answers it. Um, yeah, so it's not one thing that's going to make your apartment building work. And, mm -hmm. and I hope I haven't implied that, right? It's several things. It's like, it's how much car parking you need, what's your renter profile, how, how much can you push the zoning, mm -hmm. you know, where, where will your rents be highest, what are development charges? And so in some areas of, of Toronto, and this may surprise people from out of town, development charges are, are, are huge. They're forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in, in, in some of our suburbs. Right? So if you were planning on building 100 units, then you're paying you know, 40 times, 40,000 times 100. But if you made your units larger, and it was one of those places where the price didn't drop off, right? then you're going to be saving you know, 10 development charges, $400,000, and then 10 less kitchens. Right? So it's not one answer ever. Right? It's the mesh of, and that, this is sort of one of the things we use in our report. Just say, look, it's this. And so what we'll do is set up a, a detailed financial pro forma. And then you start stress testing that performance. Say, what if I, what if I change my parking? What if I change my unit size? What if I change my, you know, my rents and things like that? But in that spreadsheet, um, uh, Salim Musa is the guy in our firm that, that does that work. And, and you got to be like an MBA analyst type to do it because it gets pretty complex. Um, changing rents is the thing that changes the result the most. So you can noodle around with your land all day long and you can you know, adjust construction costs and go from you know, one construction technique to the other and pick up speed or save costs. But the one number that really impacts everything is, is, is the rent. Okay, now let's talk about the whole question of building a condo versus building an apartment. So I've got a site, say, and I'm trying to make uh, this decision. I talked to a lot of, I talked to one last week, says, oh, I mean, we're, gonna, we're gonna start as a rental, but we're gonna make a condo. People, are, people struggle with what to do with this land. Take family planning out of it. I know sometimes family planning might drive a decision. Sure. It's a straight business decision. Should sure. I build a condo or a rental? No, not a family planning consideration. How do you make that decision? Right, right. So let me make the picture a little bigger. You've got four buildings. You've got a hotel, a senior's home, uh, a condo, an apartment building. They all look the same from the outside. Right. But once you walk through the front door, they're different. And the reason you build them, the amount of staff you have, the structure, the financing are all different, right? So right. now, okay, so let's just recognize that, right? right. Just because they look the same doesn't mean they are the same. And that's the mistake I think we make. So if you're a condominium developer, and there are a number of them in the room here today, okay? A condo developer builds condos for business income, right? You build it, you sell it, you pay your tax, and you do it again. And then that's, that's the business, right? The apartment business is quite different. The apartment business is about wealth preservation, because you bring a ton of dough to the table, you need 30 million to the table on a $100 million deal. So wealth preservation, it's about tax deferral, because you can depreciate your building. And so typically you can depreciate your building and shelter the first five years of cash flow. So you're paying no taxes on that. So you build it because you've got money you want to park, right? 
you want to get tax deferral and you want cash flow, right? That's why pension funds are good owners of apartment buildings, right? They have more money coming in today, but they're going to need more income in the future. Yeah. So, it, but 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 they don't want to buy the forty-year-old rent control building. Yeah. Right. They want to buy good quality buildings, and and in ten years, a brand new apartment building is still brand new. If you buy a forty-year forty-year-old building in ten years, it's fifty years old. Right. Yeah. And, on, uh, on the same subject, isn't it just riskier though? I'm not better just to get that condo built and get out. Am I taking? Is it just? Is it way more riskier for me um, to do the apartment? I, I think what you don't understand is always riskier. Right. right. I think the real the real men in the room are the hotel guys, right? Like hotel guys build uh, a hotel on spec, and three weeks before they find out, you know, if they're right or not, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and so apartments, you know, you really don't find out if you're right till six months before, really three months before, right? But if you study it enough, the numbers are there. The the population growth in the city, the income. So look, if the population growth is high, if there are hardly any apartments there, if the people are older or younger or both. Right, and, um, and 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 the and, and the, the the income is high, right? Then there's a good chance that apartment's going to work. If all those things are the opposite, then you probably shouldn't build there. Right, right. Um, how do I find apartment land? Obviously, land is in some of the hottest markets in Canada is a big problem. Toronto, Vancouver, a big problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the speakers uh, up here uh, in the mixed use department um, is from is from SmartRe. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, and then a number of shopping center companies. If you look at uh, shopping centers, they're all land, they're all land and parking. Right, lots of apartment owners have excess land. You know, back in the day, we built the tower in the park. Right, yeah. um, these are now transit oriented areas with shopping and infrastructure and all grown around here. Oftentimes, um, land owners don't need the money; they would vend the land into the deal, right, and then maybe get their money out at the end with a kiss, right, or something like that. So there's some creative ways around. You know, around buying land, right? That, that I think that I think you've got to look at. But you know, the land market it, it, it is difficult. We you know we've got a panel on conversions, right? Mm -hmm. So for people who do um, student housing, they can buy hotels and convert them to student housing. Sometimes there's space left to intensify and things like that. Okay. You've got to get creative on the urb in the urban areas. But let's say if you were building out in out in Milton, or you were building out in you know Pickering or something like that, there you know there there is land generally available. It's only when you're talking about you know downtown areas where you've got to You've got to creatively adapt things and so on. Yeah. Hey, Derek, we've got just about a minute left here. So um, what, is the, what is the one thing you want to convey to the audience if you uh, give one, one piece of advice for people who are gra grappling with uh, you know, their development question? Um, watch, watch this movie. And the movie is called The Big Short. Anyone seen that movie? Just put your hands up. You've seen The Big Short. The Big Short is a great real estate movie. If you're a real estate guy, you're going to love the movie. Okay? <laughs> so it's all about these guys in 2008 and 2009 that figured out that the U.S. housing market was going to collapse. Okay? And then they shorted the market. Okay? And there were three groups that found out, and the movie sort of went with these three guys independently. Like, we started watching three movies. But one of the groups, and it was kind of like the, the, the quirkier group, you know, got in a plane, and they went down to Miami, and they flew down to Florida, and they started visiting houses. And they knock on the guy's door, and they said, tenant comes there, and he says, uh, you know, is your, is your landlord, uh, you know, Waldo Emerson? He goes, no, Waldo Emerson is my landlord's dog, <laughs> right? And the guy <laughs> bought the house in the name of the dog, <laughs> right? Okay, and then they went to, ho and they just found a whole bunch of just strange circumstances when they went to the shop floor. So that's what I would say to developers here. You know, you can sit around in your office and noodle about this thing all day long, but if you go out to the marketplace, visit the new buildings that already exist, and the older buildings that are there, just as a consumer, you will see that opportunity, right? And so that would be my one piece of advice. Just, just, just go on out there in the marketplace, in Toronto, in Vancouver, in Edmonton, or wherever, wherever you are, and just go and look, right? And I think you'll be disappointed if you're looking for an apartment, but pleasantly surprised if you say, I'm the guy that gets it and I want to build in this marketplace. Yeah, that's that, that's a great. I'll repeat the question. So, if you're building an apartment building, would you register it as a condominium, right? And I think that most of the times the answer to that is is yes, right? And um, so, because you get the flexibility of down the road, maybe syndicating this building to individual owners, you could sell off units, you could convert it into a condo, right? The caveat I would have for you here 
is that when the municipal taxes are set, sometimes if you register it as a condominium, um, your taxes are going to be higher, but it really varies um, from, from area to area. There's a guy here named Dave, David Gibson. Where are you? Just because he, he just could answer that question for you. Dave Gibson? Never mind. Anyways, so if you find Dave around here, he could tell you um, which municipalities it would be beneficial to title it as an apartment and which one would be title it as a, as a condominium. But all things being equal, um, I would say a condominium. Where's Jim? Any other, uh, any other questions? Yes? Jim? You know, um, if somebody, I'll use the Toronto example, right? Um, if somebody comes to us and says, look, I, I want to build a, a high-rise tower uh, with five levels of underground parking in Malvern, and Malvern is a tough area of Scarborough, um, you know, it's just a quick no, right? So, so in those areas there, um, you know, if, if there's a program, and, and there are different federal provincial programs at different times, that might make sense to do there. Um, you can't build high-rise product there that's expensive. You have to do you know, wood frame construction where your construction cost is lower and ultimately then, the, then, then, then your rent is lower also. Okay. Uh, Derek, the, uh, out in Halifax, it's a pretty competitive and, yes. and mature uh, rental market with a lot of competition. So what advice do you have for people out there who um, are sort of looking for the edge or looking for different markets to sort of see where do you, because there is the guy across the road, and uh, you know, apartments are being developed more and more like condo buildings out there, so uh, what markets can you point to that would probably give a good insight into what the next stage of development yeah, is? Yeah, like? yeah, so, so, so I'm, you know, I'm pretty familiar with Halifax. When you go along the Bedford Highway there, right, there are, there are a surprising number of new apartment buildings in Halifax. Kind of, it, it's similar to London, actually, and if I had to say another city in Canada that had a lot of new construction, um, it, 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 would be, it, it would be Halifax. Um, num number one, I would say if everyone is building the same type of product, and I think they are actually, because I visited a number of buildings there, you have to innovate, right? And I think that comes with your architect and with your design people, and I think you have to spend more time on that. Those buildings I visited in Halifax had a, a, a sprinkling of amenities, but they, but they were not dramatic. Right? So I would say, you know, you've got really get down to your interior designer, your architect, and, and your amenity package and make them different. I don't think the marketplace is saturated, right? Um, and, and you can see, like, you know, in London, Ontario, where they built seven, seven or 8,000 apartments since the year 2000 in a town of 300,000 people. And in Toronto, with 5 million people, we haven't built 7,000 apartments, right? So you have, to, you have to find the niche, right? And develop a better and develop a better product than, than following the herd. Really, is, is what I would say. Yes, sir. Daryl. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So, 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 so I think I think what 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 Daryl is talking about saying, look, there there are lots of and let's let's deal with the seniors group because that's an easier one to deal with, right? So they've got equity in their house and they've got money, fair enough, and they shouldn't be living in their house anymore by rights, okay? And they don't want to be taking care of house and things like that. First of all, that is a very pragmatic renter, right? So he is not going to rent this apartment in advance, right? So you're going to need to you're going to need the building, you're going to need the model, right? And then he's going to come and look at it. And then he's going to think about it. Then they're going to decide that they want to rent there. Then they'll list their house, and then they'll sell their house, and then they'll move in, right? So it's going to be a three, six, nine month process. Whereas a young guy in Toronto will kind of come in and rent the apartment the day he sees it, right? So keep in mind that if 
if there is a great market for seniors. They have a lot more than $1,000 to spend, right? I'll give you an example about a city in a minute. Um, and, and so it's going to take longer to lease up the building. That's the first thing you need to put in your pro forma if your target market is seniors. But on the other side of it, your turnover is going to be much lower. So instead of your turnover being 30 or 40%, it might be 15 or 20%. Right? So the process is just going to take a little bit longer. And then the other thing that I've noticed in cities where they built a lot of apartments is the culture actually becomes that. Right? So um, people, when they see their friends moving into nice luxury apartments, right, it's no longer something that's counter-cyclical to do. Fair enough? So you have to build it. They will come. And then as you build more, they will come more. And the first building will lease up. Uh, slower than the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. But once that culture starts happening, and so I think you've seen that happen in Halifax, and you've seen that happen in London, where lots of these buildings have um, healthy seniors in them, you know, 70, 80 years old, and, 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 they're, and they're coming out of houses. It was a great question you asked. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, you know, Hamilton, I think, is one of those surprising markets where um, you know you can buy more apartment per pound in Hamilton than most places, right? Given the given the proximity to Toronto, right? Um, so the city of Hamilton, first of all, has a number of, of grants and, and 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 benefits that they'll give you to develop. There's that enterprise zone in the downtown where they will give you um, you know a balloon mortgages for five or ten years with no interest and things like that. Um, I think you'd be surprised if you looked at the numbers in Hamilton. So you know. Hamilton is a city that is outside of Toronto. It's, it's a steel town. It's, it's, I don't know, it's Toledo. You know what I mean for the Americans here, right? Um, and there's a general perception that people in Hamilton don't have a lot of money. That's not true. And so we did a study. We compared Oakville. Oakville's a wealthy area outside of Toronto. And we counted the number of people in Oakville who make over $100,000 per year. Well, there's more people in Hamilton who make over $100,000 per year because there's so many more people in Hamilton, right? So I think Hamilton, I think Hamilton's a good city to develop in. Yeah. But, but I wouldn't do small apartments in the downtown core necessarily, right? There, there are people who are from the hammer that want to stay in the hammer and you can build apartments for them. Since I started working with people in this industry going back to 2000, maybe even earlier, and every year since then I've heard the very same thing about rental construction from, and I heard the same conversation the last week in the industry and every year in between that when I go through the numbers and when I even when I put my land in for free in an intensification site, the numbers don't pencil out. So, so yeah, I think, I think that's, that's, that's true and sometimes not true. But I think the key point is where you ask the question, the numbers don't pencil out. Mm -hmm. So people will just take a quick snapshot look at this thing, right? So mm -hmm. most of the people having this discussion with you are condo developers. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, okay, so I'll put my land in at, 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 at you know, X, right? Mm -hmm. I know how to build a condo, so I know what it costs. And then I've noticed that a number of condos I sell are rented, so I'll use that price for the rental rate, right? And then they'll say, now I need a number for expenses, so I'll take 30 or 40% for expenses, right? And, then you, and yeah, so if you do it that way, it isn't going to pencil out, right? And so, so you've really got to get down to the details. So let, let's, let's break those components down, right? So first is land. I would say that, to be fair, apartments should go on the slightly quirky piece of land. So it, you, know, you shouldn't be paying $100 or $120 per foot to build an apartment building. So you've got to be picking uh, you know, an A minus or, or, or a B spot, right? Good, good area, um, or maybe a bad location in that good area, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Second is, is construction cost. The cost of building uh, a, a condo is not the same as building an apartment building. Uh, the unit mix is different, the amenity space is different, the phasing in is different, and all those things. But the third one, and probably the most important one, is the rent, right? And, and rent drives this business. Land has an impact, but you understand land. Construction has an impact, but you understand construction. It's the rental rate. So the difference between saying it's 240 a foot and 260 a foot, okay, which are normal numbers for the city of Toronto, is the difference between you know, a deal working and, an, and a deal not working. We'll talk about it a little bit later on in the discussion, but really the place that developers get it wrong is, uh, is on the rent level. So it's even level. though all these years passed, in yeah. 2000 they're having this discussion, the huge cap rate compression, huge improvement in attainable rents over the period, they still find the same thing. Where are they, 
Where are they tripping up that they get exactly the same answer over well, such well, a long period? Well, so if you buy the land at the rack rate, right. and then you hire a GC at the rack rate, and then you hire a third party manager whose key function is cutting costs, not raising rents, mm -hmm. right? Those what factors about the, What about the people combined. who are putting the land for free? This is what I, I hear the most. Because you know, we all know these people, they all have intensification yeah. sites. L L can't do it. Land typically, um, land typically you know, makes up 10 or 15% of the cost, mm -hmm. right? Everything comes down to revenue. Vince, go, go to slide six. Maybe we'll just get right to that. Because you're, you're sorely first thing off in the morning here, and I just need to put you <laughs> in your place. Yeah, just, 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 just keep going. You'll, you'll, you'll get the one slide that just shows the impact of, of, of rent levels, and we'll come back to you. Yeah, you can go a little bit faster than that. Yeah. Okay, right there. Okay, so, so back up one. So this, this is, look, I would say that if there's one thing you need to remember from, you know, from, from today's symposium, it's this. So you take purchase price divided, your, your price of your building equals your NOI divided over your cap rate, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say that you do, you do an analysis of a building and your rent is uh, $1,600. You figure that out, fair mm -hmm. enough? But you're projecting two or three years into the future now, yep. right? If that rent were $1,700, which is pretty easy to get wrong sitting here today projecting the future, and I haven't really determined my unit mix and I haven't determined my amenity base and things like that, right? So $100 times 12 at a 5% cap rate equals $24,000 in value. Right. So you see my point? Yeah. So you know you can have some play in your land there. You can have some play in your construction costs. And if you get those wrong, they're going to impact your result. But if you get your rent wrong, it's going to have a dramatic impact on this. And so if your rent is off by $200, that's $48,000 in value that you're creating, right? Mm -hmm. So let me put it another way. If, if you could spend $24,000 inside your apartment spiffing it up, all you would need to do is get $100 more in rent. And I think most developers would agree that if you spend $24,000 inside an apartment, you can get $100 in rent and sort of have a break even. Uh, my argument is you could do spend a lot less and get that, right? right? So, so that's the point at the end of the day. And, and some of the other speakers, uh, Jennifer Nevitt is speaking today um, after lunch, and she's talking about lease up, and her comments will be related to revenue, right? So it's about the revenue, Vince. The land does matter, the construction cost does matter, but it's about driving rent, right? And, and three factors drive rents. Location, which is fixed, right? Mm -hmm. then, then the unit design, mm -hmm. then the amenities, right? And then you wrap that all with the customer service property management package, right? So when you think about you know, rents in, in downtown Toronto, where you're gonna have to build probably smaller units with less parking and things like that, right? So this younger downtown renter um, sleeps in the apartment, lives in the building in the neighborhood. So you design a building for that guy. Right. right. That's not the same as designing a building in, in Vaughan or in Pickering or in Oakville for a senior. They're living in the apartment, man, and they need a much larger apartment and a different amenity package and things like that. So it's not one size fits all. And that's where I think people say the deal doesn't pencil out because they haven't drilled down enough into it. But specifically, it's, it's the rental. It's the rental rate that gets them in trouble in their analysis. Okay. Okay. All right, that's good. Sir. So don't so ask me that question anymore. Like it's been <laughs> asked. That, that, that's, that's the it's answer. It's been asked a lot. Yeah. Okay, so let's back up, Jeremy. This is the, the fifth uh, version of these seminars. Why do you put these seminars on? Well, we, we started in, you know, five years ago, and we had, we had 30 people who attended. Mm -hmm. I had to bring all my staff out, and that got us up to 60 yeah. and make the room look full. But, but well, you know, the, there's a lot of real estate seminars, but most seminars don't do a deep drill on one topic. So this is all we talk about is new apartment construction, right? We're drinking from the fire hose sort of thing. And so we recognize that there's a, a niche in the marketplace, and, and that niche got created because our province and other provinces have had rent controls, and rent controls, Vince, as you know better than anybody else, really hurts the industry. It stops new apartment construction, it stops innovation and things like that. And then we, 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 to a large extent, lifted rent controls in the province, right? Uh, certainly on new product, older product is vacancy decontrolled, so it brings it up to the market. But the culture here is still tied back to that culture that we grew up in, right? It tends to be about cutting costs and not necessarily raising revenue. So that merchant builder class that was here in the 60s and the 70s, the guys who built all the towers in the park, all the major complexes uh, um, in Toronto and Ontario, those guys, most of them have moved on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, 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 and their, you know, their companies have gone on to developing other assets, mainly condos, hotels, and things like that. It's, it's time to bring them back. So the purpose is a deep drill on, on, on one topic. Like All we're talking about for two days is new apartment construction. OK. So since I've known you, Derek, you've been a, a thought leader in new construction. When I first came to FERPO, which was in 2000, and I'll never forget this, you took me and said, Vince, 
Welcome to the industry. And you took me on a trip to Chicago to look yes. at, uh, and you were the guy who was talking about new construction before anybody else was, even in the, in the late 90s. So I'm curious, you know, you, you were talking about how the, the potential was there and there's an opportunity. And now we're seeing a surge. So why the surge now? You know, you've been following it for a while. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I made a prediction in 1998, you'd see cranes with 5,000 apartments, you know, uh, being built. <laughs> so I was off by about 18 years, I think, you know. But um, I, I think that the perfect storm has happened. One, we needed to fix up our legislative issue, right? Mm -hmm. And we have, and that's been, to a large extent, codified now, so we're not too worried about it. And then you had a combination of, of, of low interest rates, right? Cap rate compression. Um, population growth in Canada's major cities, and thank goodness we've had these shadow condo rental market, otherwise we would have had a crisis. We'll talk more about that later. Yeah. Right? So cap rate, interest rate, you know, population growing, and then investor demands. Um, um, apartments have been recognized now as a, as a major asset class, and they weren't before. When you and I worked in the business, apartments were the orphan of no, the business. Now we saw a lot of right? change. Uh, right. There's a lot of new players in the industry. Right, right, right. And institutional players yeah. who I think expect a higher level of service. They, they, they expect more data, you know, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And, and, and foreign, foreign investors love Canada. They just can't find enough commercial real estate to buy here. So the, so the combination of all those things, but specifically I think investors willing to pay low cap rates and high price per unit. So we're talking about price per units on new construction of you know 250 to 450 per unit, right? And so you have to accept those, right? The cap rates aren't maybe not that different, maybe four to five percent, but all those things combined have resulted in I think a resurgence of, of, of new apartment construction. And, and it's not a wave, I mean, it's still a glacier. There's lots of opportunity here. This ship is just about to sail, right? right? Okay. So you referenced it earlier, the culture of Canadian. I don't know if you have any more to say on that, but how would you describe the Canadian culture of the apartment industry? Yeah, well, you know, about 10% of the room here is, is American, or 15% of the room here is American, and, and a number of the speakers here are American. And there's a reason for that, in that they have a, a, a head start compared to where we are, mm -hmm. uh, just because they, they live in a much more competitive apartment environment um, than we do. But if you look at this thing, I would say I'd look at it maybe politically, Right, um, 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 socially and then economically. Right, so politically, um, all three levels of government could do something to make apartments work. So if the federal government would bring in something like a MERB program again, we had the MERB program in the '80s, where you could create a capital cost allowance and you know use it against other income. Right, if we had something like a 1031 rollover in the U.S., where when you sell a building, you can take your money and reinvest it again in another building without paying tax. So we have so many apartment buildings and so much wealth here just sitting there tied up in an apartment building and an owner can't or won't sell his building because he's got to give more than half of it away in taxes. trapped. Yeah. Right, right. So I think at the federal level we could do something and I don't think it would cost that much and there would be a real stimulus to, to, to the economy, right, politically. Um, socially, I think, you know, we have, we have social issues in Toronto with housing with affordability, with homelessness, and things like that. And there is a tie to you know, rent control and homelessness. You know, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. William, you know the guy who wrote the book on it, right? Yeah, yeah. We had him a speaker here one year. William Tucker. Yeah, William Tucker, yeah. And, and so I think that socially we have issues because people can't live where they need to live because there aren't rental apartments there. And so sometimes people say there's lots of rental condos. And there are lots of rental condos. But when you live in a rental condo, you have no tenure. So, you know, Vince, imagine you and I with our wives, we sell our house and then we move into a nice condo. And then a year or two later, you get to notice that the guy's selling it, you've got to move. That's an unacceptable uh, scenario for us. Right. So we're not gonna rent, we're not gonna rent a condominium. If you go to rent an apartment, there's so few of them, <clears throat> they're 40 years old, there's no washer dryer, there's no air conditioning, you know, and things like that. So, and then so politically there's a problem socially, and then, and then economically, I mean, it would be a huge boom to Toronto to have, you know, 10 or 20,000 apartments built in parking lots that are, that are getting no revenue, right? And now the tax revenue coming in for the apartments will be significant. The infrastructure is already here, the transit's here, and things like that. So I think culturally, we're just getting ready to go down that road.